Hi, let's talk about spinal nerves. In this video, I'll talk to you about the structure of a single spinal nerve and the various functions of the parts of those structures. First and foremost, let's distinguish between cranial and spinal nerves. So cranial nerves have their nuclei in the brain, largely in the brain stem, and one of them, the accessory nerve, in the brain itself. There are 12 pairs of them. Uh, they each may either be sensory, motor, or mixed. So both sensory and motor. Spinal nerves, on the other hand, have their nuclei within the spinal cord. There are 31 pairs of them, and they are entirely all mixed. So they have both sensory and motor components to them. The technical definition of a nerve is a bundle of fiber of the peripheral nervous system. So uh, whether it's cranial or spinal, anything that we're talking about that is a nerve is of the PNS. Bundles of fibers um, within the central nervous system are known as tracts. So let's take a look at this illustration so that we can best distinguish the elements of a spinal nerve. So I am circling now the spinal cord. This is a, a transverse section. We can see a part of the laminae going into the spinous process of a vertebrae there. Here's the body of that vertebrae. So we can see that the spinal cord would be within the spinal canal, so that vertebral foramen. There are two sets of rootlets that are of the spinal nerve. There's a dorsal set and a ventral set. So here is posterior, also known as dorsal. Um, these rootlets are going to coalesce into roots. So there's a dorsal root and a ventral root. The dorsal root is ganglionated. So we, we see a, a large uh, swelling on that dorsal root. It's important to understand that the dorsal root and rootlets are sensory. So we have elements coming into the central nervous system that way. Whereas the ventral rootlets and root are efferent, or largely motor, so they're having signals come out of it. When we come to this junction here, that's the trunk of the spinal nerve. So that trunk is going to be conducting both afferent and efferent fibers sensory and motor fibers. And it is going to ramify into a dorsal primary ramus and a ventral primary ramus. Most of what we discuss as nerves um, are VPRs, ventral primary rami, but uh, DPRs, dorsal primary Rami also serve uh, both afferent and efferent functions, but these are usually for the, the posterior aspect of, of the body. So the, uh, the hypaxial musculature of, of the lower back, deep back muscles, uh, the posterior aspect of the, uh, the neck and the head. So if you sort of draw this imaginary line going out from the transverse process of a vertebrae, Typically, but not always, but typically, dorsal primary rami serve what's posterior to it, and ventral primary rami serve what is anterior to that. Um, we can also see a couple of what are known as rami communicantes, uh, or communicating branches. There are white rami communicantes, which conduct uh, fibers out, and then there are gray rami communicantes, which conduct fibers back in. Uh, 
so the, the sympathetic trunk is a, uh, a series of ganglia and fibers that connect them that uh, go from the base of the skull all the way down to the coccyx. There are different regions. So there's a cervical sympathetic trunk, a thoracic trunk, a lumbar trunk, a, a, a sacral trunk. Um, and so depending on where you are throughout the vertebral column, you have the uh, sympathetic uh, trunks that are like that associate with that. So there's both a left and a right side, and these are means by which sympathetic fibers can be distributed throughout the body. So um, fibers l l come from the CNS out through the ventral primary rami in through the white rami communicantes, and they can do things. We'll get to that in the sympathetics video. And then they can leave the trunk and go back and distribute via the uh, the dorsal and the ventral primary rami through gray rami communicantes. So white conducts into the trunk, gray conducts back away from the trunk. When we talk about um, nervous plexuses, uh, so these would be somatic plexuses, these are um, associations typically of ventral primary rami, but it's it's good to, to have the, uh, the overall structure that rootlets are the structures which communicate directly with the spinal cord. Uh, these rootlets communicate with roots. Uh, within rootlets and roots, dorsal are going to be afferent. They conduct in, whereas ventral are efferent, they conduct out. Where the roots come together, these are the trunk. Uh, trunks are mixed, both afferent and efferent. And then those trunks branch into dorsal and ventral primary rami. And as you're looking at a cross section of a uh, spinal nerve, uh, the thing that I always look for, and I'll erase here to, to show you this detail, is the uh, the dorsal root is ganglionated. So we can see the, the dorsal root ganglion, or the DRG, on that dorsal root. So let's take a look at a cadaveric view. Um, here we have the, uh, the dorsal aspect of the spinal cord, and we can see many dorsal rootlets. We can also see um, some ventral rootlets here. These dorsal rootlets come together as the dorsal root, which is occupied nearly entirely by this dorsal root ganglion, whereas the ventral root continues on. There's our trunk. And then going towards the, uh, the deep back is the dorsal primary ramus. And wrapping around here, continuing on, is the ventral primary ramus. So the rami, as well as the trunk, are mixed, both afferent and efferent. The spinal cord itself, to, to orient you, uh, here is a vertebral body. So this is a transverse section of a vertebral body. Uh, the, the laminae for that body should come up approximately where these dashed lines are. So this particular specimen has had a laminectomy, so that, uh, that posterior wall of the spinal canal has been removed. Uh, we can see some meninges here. These are the coverings of the, the spinal cord. And then within the space, we have a very nice spinal cord. The spinal cord is uh, usually about the, the thickness of maybe a, a large pencil or pen. There are some enlargements, and we'll talk about that. Um, but for most of the, the cord, it, it's, it's not as large as one might presume. Centrally in the cord, we have the gray matter. That's this lighter area here that I'm outlining here with uh, 
ventral and dorsal horns. Uh, that gray matter is where uh, the nuclei are, where there are synapses, and uh, this is where integration occurs. Whereas the surrounding area here, you know, all about, that's all white matter. White matter is where a lot of the, the tracks are running. So white matter is all about uh, communication or sending signals from point A to point B. Here's a nice illustration of the, uh, the spinal cord um, with its associated um, osteological surroundings. So we can see uh, the, the colored aspect is the spinal cord and then anterior to that are the bodies of the vertebrae and they have been conveniently numbered for us. So there are seven cervical, 12 thoracic and five lumbar vertebrae, uh, five sacral uh, vertebrae and generally three to five coccygeal as well. Um, the interesting thing about this is that uh, the numbers of the spinal nerves largely correlate to the numbers of the vertebrae. A large exception is in the cervical region where we have seven cervical vertebrae but eight cervical nerves. And so the first cervical nerve, C1, exits between the first cervical vertebrae and the skull. C2 exits inferior to C1. C3 below C2 and so on and so forth until we get to C8, which exits inferior to C7. Below T1 is the first thoracic nerve. So um, after T1, all of the spinal nerve numbers come out distal or inferior to the vertebrae that they're named after, which is somewhat convenient. But the exception is here in the, uh, in the C-spine where we've got eight cervical nerves, but seven cervical vertebrae. Um, we can see that there are a few places in the spinal cord where uh, the cord itself is larger. Uh, one of them is this cervical enlargement in the distal portion of the C-spine. The other is this lumbar enlargement in the distal portion of the thoracic spine, lower lumbar spine. Um, these enlargements uh, are hypertrophied uh, neuronal tissue um, because there are many more nuclei in the ventral horns uh, from lower motor neurons. So the limbs are very complex structures that require a lot of, of integration. Um, and so to serve the upper limb, we have the cervical enlargement. And to serve the lower limb, we have the lumbar enlargement. But uh, since this is a head and neck course, really uh, anything below T1 is out of the scope of discussion. Lucky for you. And so recall there are both dorsal and ventral primary rami. Uh, it's the ventral primary rami that in the cervical and brachial plexuses are going to come together to form associations or networks of nerves to spawn new nerves. Um, and these include the cervical plexus. The cervical plexus is C1, 2, 3, and 4. And then C5, 6, 7, 8, and T1, ventral primary rami, are the brachial plexus. The cervical plexus uh, is going to be sensory for the neck and uh, lower elements of the head. Um, it's going to be uh, afferent for trapezius and sternocleidomastoid. Um, it's going to be uh, motor and sensory for the diaphragm, and it's going to provide some 
motor innervation for elements of the uh, of the scalene uh, muscles, whereas the brachial plexus is the afferent and efferent for the upper limbs, inclusive of the shoulders. But anything below that, so our purview is C1 through T1. Anything below that, you know, here be dragons. That's beyond the scope of uh, a head and neck anatomy course. So that leads us into our assessment question. And uh, that is, uh, which is the most proximate part of a spinal nerve that contains both afferent and efferent fibers? So the question is asking you, which feature of a spinal nerve is closest to the spine and is mixed? Um, dorsal primary ramus is mixed. Not very close to the spine, however. Dorsal root is not mixed. It is afferent, but it is very close to the spine. Trunk is mixed, and it's somewhat close to the spine. Let's hold on to that. Ventral primary ramus, mixed, not closer than the trunk. Ventral root, efferent, but close to the spine. So the, uh, the element of a single spinal nerve, which is closest to the spinal cord and mixed, is the trunk out of all possible answers here. Thank you very much for your time.